Welcome back to How Soccer Explains Leadership. Thanks again for being a part of the conversation and thank you for engaging in that conversation, taking what you're learning from this and, and making the world a better place to be able to um, use it in all that you do, hopefully as a leader in many different areas. So I'm Phil Dark, your host, and with me is my co-host, my brother in arms, Paul Jobson. Paul, how you doing, man? Phil, doing well, man. Just plugging away and youth sports in our household and wrapping up basketball season and indoor soccer season and and I don't, I don't know what else but all the things but it's been good we've got a team coming in this weekend to waco from dallas that uh, marcy and i are going to work with so that'll be a lot of a lot of fun we get to work with with groups that you know that are really wanting to grow and in, in more than just the game right so that's that'll be a lot of fun this weekend and yeah then then the back we're on the back end of the of the semester for the kiddos so things are moving along pretty pretty quickly man but things things are good here how how are things with you buddy yeah no it's going great so i'm assuming that's warrior way they're coming down to do warrior way camp is that cool yeah they are they are they are it'll be a warrior way warrior way camp so to speak yeah cool. awesome awesome Things are going well too here you know i mean it's we finished the uh, high school season so that's you know a bummer but it's in the context of some pretty heavy family stuff. My dad is back in the hospital, and so we're working through that. So prayers appreciated there. So that's been kind of the heavy time working through that, and I'm um, just grateful for the care he's getting and, and being able to do that. But I was able to show him Justin's flag football game in the hospital. That brought brought a smile to his face, and you know Justin getting off the soccer field and hitting the hitting the football field, doing that right before the Super Bowl, and. You know, basketball fouled out of his game, true to form in uh, the soccer world, you know, fouled out of the basketball game. That's what we do as soccer players too often. Sure. Right. And uh, yeah, you know, just got a lot of other things going on that are that are really, really good things that are happening in the, the world of ministry, in the world of family. Got a lot of birthdays. So celebrating life and just really trying to... <laughs> Uh, keep my dad encouraged in the midst of some some tough times. So yeah, you know it's yeah. it's something that I get more and more. Um, you know, as as we get closer, um, older, more mature, whatever we want to call it. You know, it's it's just more of a really trying to value what we have each day, right? And and what what God has for us in each day, and how we can how we can live that out and what it looks like and how we can encourage others and pour into others and create legacies and all those things that, that really come into focus when, when our parents are starting and, you know, are, are starting to, to have that, that happen to our parents. So, you know, with that, creating legacies, the last couple episodes, we've had legends of the game and today is no exception to that. It's no different um, though. Yep. Very, very excited for this conversation we get to have today uh, with Shellis Heinemann. Um, a name that uh, if you've been spending any time in the in the world of soccer, you know that name. If you've listened to this episode, you know that name as someone who has impacted many, many lives in the world of soccer. We're going to get into the the history of, of you know, uh, his life, uh, coaching career, before the coaching career, different life lessons that he was able to learn. And I'm just really excited for this episode. Shellis, how you doing? Well, I'm doing very well, Phil. Thanks, thanks for the invite. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, I've heard so much about you through other people. We briefly have got to meet at the convention um, before you were getting ready to play a little pickleball. So I knew right away we were going to connect on different levels, but I've been very uh, excited to, to be able to have a deeper conversation, get to know you better. But like I said, so many people have, you've impacted so many lives. I'm grateful for that because I think we have you to thank for a lot of people that have come on the show. And I know you would probably say, oh no, they have done it all on their own, but I know that you've had a lot of impact. And so I just love to hear from you to briefly share your story, how you've developed your passion for soccer, for coaching, for leadership, for pouring into, to other humans and, um, and really what you're, what you're now doing in retirement. Yeah. Happy to help out any way I can. And those are awfully kind words. I've been very fortunate to meet some fantastic people and and not only uh, help them, but they've also helped me. But uh, yeah, my, my life is really a different life than, than you are normally find being raised and uh, born in a, in, a, in a Portuguese colony called Macau, China. And there, there I started my childhood. And it was interesting because I looked back recently on um, the population of Macau. 
And at the time I was living here, there were 5,000 Portuguese on about a 12 square miles uh, peninsula and 400,000 uh, Chinese. So you can see very much in the minority, very difficult uh, time, but growing up was, was like any kid, fun and, uh, but challenging. Really played soccer to just the neighborhoods and never really anything organized just because Portuguese loved the game. And so when I came to the States, obviously I was better than most Americans at that time, but I, uh, I wasn't being offered an opportunity to play because of no high school soccer in Ohio. We ended up in a place called Springfield, Ohio, moved to Bandale, Ohio, where I went to high school and my cousin, Patty Souza who I love very much, unfortunately, in his past. But he kind of took me under his wings. My father, my father was killed. So, so he took me under his wings and, and helped me get involved in a German soccer club called Dayton Nato Pies. Probably average age of the team was 26 to 40. And uh, they all loved me. You know, I'm a 16-year-old 16, 16 that used to run and chase after the balls when they, didn't, when they wouldn't or couldn't. So it was an enjoyable time. I did well enough there. I was I a was, uh, pretty good athlete in high school. I did track, track and American football. And the, the thing that impacted me probably the most in my life was when I was in high school, I had two coaches, a coach named Bob Costello and a coach named George Pervacus. They were both my football coaches that, that liked me and uh, they saw something in me. And they kept encouraging me to do better in school. And of course, you know, schooling and, and the language and all those things weren't, weren't uh, my favorite. So I, um, I, I started taking it a little bit more serious. And thank God I did because I ended up getting a soccer scholarship only if I, got, if I did well enough on the ACT test. At that time, mm-hmm. you're a great point average in your ACT test. So I went and took the ACT test. And coach called me and says, congratulations. This was Easter Illinois University. Rich Teller was the coach, and he called me and says, congratulations, you've been accepted, you're eligible. I said, really, coach, what did I get on that ACT test? He said, you got a, you got a 16. I said, wow, great. What, what did I need to be eligible? He said, you needed a 16. <laughs> so, <laughs> hey, who's going to blow it out of the water, right? We don't need to. So, uh, <laughs> but those coaches were the people that affected me the most in my life, really. and. Why did I become a coach? Because they influenced me into where I am today. I'll never forget them. I always honor them. And I hope to do that to, for others as well. Yeah. And so from, from there, you did go into coaching and, and you coach a lot of different places. Can you just kind of walk us through that journey yeah. of your coaching and how you just, how you develop your coaching through those different times? Absolutely. But just back up just a little bit. When I came out of college, I had a physical education degree. And I felt, and I went out and taught one year. I said, oh, listen, you know, I was teaching elementary and they, those uh, young kids were just too wound up for me too, you know, wanting to, every day was a tag or some kind of dodgeball game or something. And it really wore me down. You know, I said, this is not for me. I need, I need to find something that suits Shellos better. So I went and got a master's degree at Murray State. After that, I was playing professional soccer in uh, Cincinnati with uh, American Soccer League with um, uh, uh, Cincinnati Comets. Someone in the stand saw me, and I didn't realize anyone wanted to talk to me after the games. So when I talked to him, I don't, I don't remember his first name, but his last name was Pickering. <laughs> and he said, uh, would you like to come to Brazil? I know I've noticed you're Portuguese. Would you like to come to Brazil? We have a teaching position for you, and we'll, we'll give you some opportunities to continue to play soccer and maybe learn more. You know, this was uh, 1970 when Brazil won the World Cup, so everybody was excited about Brazil. So I went down there. I had been down there before to visit family. So I went to Sao Paulo, and I was talking to a, a, one of the people at the school system that I was teaching and coaching at, and he said, why don't you do what they call an estagio? Nostalgia was like an apprentice coach, and they assign you to a team. Well, I said, I'd love to, but, you know, I'm, you know, I don't have a car. I don't get around very well. And he goes, well, we'll make sure it's a closed team. So it was only about a, 
a mile away from where I live. And uh, I was able to catch the bus. And it was Sao Paulo Futebol Club. It was one of the best clubs in, the, in South America at the time. Jose Poi was with Aguayan. Uh, Pedro Rocha, the captain of Uruguay, Valdir Pérez, goalkeeper for Brazil national team. So I'm talking high end. And uh, so I spent a year and a half doing my stage, you know, taking courses, but more particularly paying attention to people. And uh, funny story, at a convention one year, and a guy comes up to me and says, hey, show us. I remember you from Sao Paulo Futebol Club. You were doing an estagio there. And I said, I was, yeah. He said, do you remember uh, playing against Palmeiras? It was a friendly game, so it wasn't a full game. And, and, and he said, that's a picture of you on the bench. I go, really? I'd love to see it. Of course, back in those days, they had the longer hair, much, much more bigger smile and youthful. And, uh, and so I look at the picture and I go, wow, yeah, thanks so much. Can, can you get me this picture? I said, yeah, I'll be happy to. But before I let you go, do you know who was sitting next to you? Well, that was doing an estagio with Palmeiras. And I said, no, he looks familiar, but I don't know. And he goes, that, that was uh, Carlos Alberto Pereira, who ended up coaching Brazil national team. <laughs> and, and I said, wow, you're kidding me. He goes, yeah, he did the same thing you did. And then typical Brazilian, he says, what happened to you? <laughs> so I, uh, I came back to the United States. I was on, on, on leave. And I came back to the United States. And my wife, I met her in college. We, and she, we had a son. And uh, she, uh, she only lived about 30 miles away. So, she, so the opportunity came. My coach came to me and said, hey, why don't you stay and be my graduate assistant? And then you can uh, take over the position to I'm going to retire next year. And I said, yeah, let me talk. You know, I have a contract in Brazil and stuff like that. Let me talk to my wife. So I talked to her. She said, that would be the best thing. Because we've been down a year and a half. And she never really got the language. And so uh, I went back to him and said, okay, I'll do it. I already have a master's degree. So I'll work on a specialist degree. And I chose Guinness and Kelsman because of their leadership. And all the things you need to know as you're going in working with young players. I always saw myself, you know, my, my dream job was to get me a college job. Now here, here it is on, on the doorstep for me. So I did the, the master's or a specialist degree and then um, got my guidance and counseling degree and was coaching. Well, the coach did resign and I got the position as a young 27, 28 year old. Now I broke my contract in Brazil, so I, I couldn't get back and play soccer in a, in a competitive team because of the broken contract. But I made that decision for the welfare of my, my growth in coaching and also for the welfare of my family. So here I was in my alma mother, East Illinois, coaching at 27, maybe going on 28 years old, and I had my dream job. But I was a young coach, and I had no mentoring, if that makes sense. That's, that's, that was scary. Because I did everything that I tried, that I learned in Brazil and Sao Paulo, and I spent a year and a half. But the difference was, and it didn't take me long to realize, I wasn't dealing with elite players of the world. I was, I was dealing with high school kids that just, you know, just graduated and college kids and a lot of international kids, but got on well with it. As a young coach, I was out there practicing as well with the guys, you know, because I loved the game so much. Well, it didn't take me long to realize that you can't tell them what to do. And correct them if you're doing the same mistake. So I started backing <laughs> off from that. And I learned from that. But, I, but I'll tell you where I was really fortunate. And like I said, I didn't have any mentorship. But I, I was very observant of people. So down the road that we used to play against was Indiana. Coached by a legend, Jerry Yagley. St. Louis University, Harry Keel. SIU, Edwardsville, Bob Gulker. Quincy College, Jack McKenzie at Western Illinois, John McKenzie. I was surrounded with some of the best coaches in the United States in the Midwest. And I think they took an interest in me because I was a young coach. I was always inquisitive. So I went from there and then I just stayed there really seven really wonderful years. I could not think of a better job in my life. 
we were very good. We got into the NCAA tournament. We were a Division II team. Our first year of Division I, we both in a final four and hit lose to the eventual champion, UConn. And then I got some opportunities. Other people were looking at me and said, hey, would you be interested in making a move? Well, I loved it where I was. You know, that's where I went to college. That's where I grew up. That's where my, both my children were born. That's where my wife was from. I just absolutely loved it there. But it was really, and this is for younger coaches, it wasn't the right place. It was difficult to work there. It was um, so much, and I learned this lesson extremely well. Sometimes you can't give that person that reigns that they deserve, but you can show them appreciation. You can recognize what they have done. No different than a soccer player. Hey, listen, I'm not going to be able to start you, but man, you're getting better. Your, your left foot has really improved tremendously. Just that, those positive words really affected me. And I think I ran a lot in that in my coaching. So I, I went to Southern Methodist University and spent 24 wonderful years there. I had made four different athletic directors in Patria, and I got along with them all. And I had a president that really liked me. And part of the reason he liked me so much because I was teaching martial arts and his hmm. son was in my class. Now, his son was an adult. He was doing a master's degree. And so he and his wife would come and just sit throughout the classes. I mean, people had to set up appointments with him to meet him. And I, I, I'm meeting him three times a week, you know. <laughs> and I always found a way to say, man, our soccer really needs this. Or our soccer really needs this. Really soccer. I got it. But he, he was a wonderful, wonderful man, uh, President Ty. And unfortunately, he, he uh, got cancer and passed. Yeah, so, uh, but I, but I had some really good people working with, so I spent 24 great years there. I moved, I went, moved on because a friend of mine that you might know the name, Clark Hunt, who owns the Kansas City Chiefs, those mm-hmm. Chiefs, they just won a, another Super Bowl dynasty. I was so, so happy to go. I went to the three, three of the last Super Bowls. I chose not to go to this one, mostly because it was so that I got expensive being in Vegas at that time, you know, I won't go into the details, but I didn't go. I quickly contacted him after the match and uh, congratulated him and his family. And so he was on the team. And his dad was Lamar Hunt, you know. So uh, Clark came to me after my 24th year and said, hey, uh, I'd like you to take the position in FC Dallas. We need, we need, we need some coaching there. You know, just let, the, let the, the manager go. And I said, you know, I don't know, man. I, I really like it here. I get a really good team or what, you know, we've been at the NCAA playoffs 23 of 20, 24 years, something like that. And, and a very good team and that final four a few times. And he says, well, I really, I really need you. And I thought about it, thought about it. I went to the Euros where I was in Switzerland and Austria and it really influenced me. I was so excited to go to the stand, packed stands and, you know, excitement. And you know, World Cup Euros are like that. And I called him from there and said, yes, I'll do it. And so I did almost six years with, with FC Dallas. Truly enjoyed it. Did I make the right decision? Absolutely. I grew not only as a coach, but as a, a person and as a leader. Uh, I found more difficulties that I've never experienced before. You know, the, the rules are a little bit different. You, know, you can let a player go. You can trade a player without them approving it. And I really didn't know what the hell I was doing, quite honestly, compared to the last, the last bit. You know, when we went to the final, lost in, in Toronto against a very good team, Colorado Rapids, for the MLS, MLS Cup. And so I learned in that. I came back and I said to my wife, sweetheart, I need to take one complete year to recover. That was the hardest job I've ever had in my life. I mean, I've had, well, you know, people say, well, you know, I got a soccer season that goes for three months at college and then I do recruiting and I do dance, I do camps, I do that. For me, it was nothing but coaching. It was nothing but coaching the pro team, preseason, scouting, going and finding players throughout the country. I mean, I, I went to Uruguay, Buenos Aires, Ghana, uh, uh, Kobasi. I mean, I traveled a lot in the world to, to find players. And I was away from my family a lot. That, that was the hard thing. But saying all that, I learned a lot. 
you know, I was able to share a lot of information with people. Um, it's, it's a funny thing to say, but I learned a lot about myself. And so after uh, that year, almost exactly to the day, I get a phone call from Grand Canyon University, the assistant AD at one time, Mike Moth said, we like to hire you. We just let their coach go. We like to hire you. I said, Mike, I don't know if I want to go back to college. You know, my agent and I are talking to some other teams right now. So he came to Dallas. We sat and talked. And I said, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll come in and consult him. I went to Grand Canyon University. The president and his vice president met with me for over three hours. The whole time I'm thinking I'm, I'm going to be a consultant. I'll tell you, it was their value just to bring me in because they showed me the stadium that they would build for me. It was a beautiful stadium that exists today. A $11 million soccer stadium for a college. It was amazing. And, and I said to them, what direction is the field going? He looked at his vice president. He says, going east-west. And I said, well, the NCAA just made a, a, a rule saying you can't go east-west with your field because the sun is always affecting one of the team. So you wouldn't be able to play on this field. The president looked at the vice president, said, make it go north-south. Coach, what we got to do to hire you? So we discussed, uh, we discussed the opportunities, the salaries, uh, the commitments, a four-year contract. And that went well. We got into the end silver tournaments a couple of times. And then after the four-year contract, I'm packing, getting ready to leave. And he decides that uh, he wants to get an extension. So the extension came of, of five years. And I, I said maybe two with an option of three. And coronavirus came. You know, health issue came. So a lot of different things came for me to say, I think I'm finished. So I came back to Dallas and living very close to my children and enjoying life today. So that's a quick story, a long story, but <laughs> to your question. Nah, it's yeah, a great that, story. Uh, I love it. Yeah. It's one of the things we always talk about, Coach, on this is that we just love hearing people's stories. And, and the great thing, I think sometimes I remember being the young coach and thinking there's, there's one way to get where I want to be. And that's, it's not, it's, it couldn't be further from the truth. So I think folks come on and tell them their story is just so awesome just to hear like there, there really isn't one path. It's, it's yeah. your path. You know, I, I think that's true for even kids looking to play in college. It's like your path is different than everybody else's, you know, make your path, be who you are, follow the road that God puts ahead of you and, and, and go and enjoy it. And uh, I just love it. I, I mean, so I remember so many of those steps, just kind of following your career because yep. you know, being in soccer, and I think we have a lot of folks that we know that are, you know, similar, and just following your career is always amazed by the steps you made. Now, just hearing it in more detail is just, is awesome. And I remember the Grand Canyon move and the stadium they built, obviously that is there. I did not realize that they had it built in the wrong direction. That's a great <laughs> bit of information there. Is that, Bill, being a goalkeeper, can really appreciate, you know, I, some I being can. his eyes probably. Yep. Um, yep. but, uh, but that's, that's amazing. You know, one thing that, you know, the soccer piece is so awesome. One thing we, we, I think we skipped over a little bit, we just kind of, you know, you talked about, you know, being born in Macau and yeah, can, I know there was a, a transition there out of, out of Macau, you flee the country. Can you take us through that a little bit? Cause I'm sure that, and it tells us how that kind of impacted you as a child impacted kind of who you, who you are today. Yeah. You know, my family, my grandfather. And my grandmother, my grandmother was born in Macau. Okay. So she was Portuguese, born in Macau. My grandfather was from Hong Kong, but he was more of a, a European background. But he was a captain of a ship. So a merchant ship. So he traveled up and down to Asia, to Pearl River and, and throughout Asia. And uh, so my family, all my aunts and uncles, my father, were all born in Shanghai. And my mother's family, uh, were Russian and they fled Russia, what they call white Russians, and they ended in Shanghai as well. So my father and my mother, of course, met in some club, dancing club or something, because they both were <laughs> uh, musicians, and uh, and that's how we, they met. 1949, Mao Zedong, in October, took over China. He became the, the leader of China. At that time, it was a rebellion with Kim Tai Chek. Kim Tai Chek end up going to, to a place called Taiwan or Formosa. And that's where Taiwan was developed. So that was the people not wanting the communism. They wanted to leave. So 
1949, my mother travels from Macau, uh, from Shanghai to Macau, eight months pregnant with me. So I was born November 4th, October 1st. If I'd have been in Shanghai, it would have been a little bit different, wouldn't it? So a lot of the family members had a very hard time getting, getting out of Chinese rule. Coming to them. So Macau being Portuguese, you know, was more free, but I told you earlier, the numbers were 5,000 to 400,000. But as a kid, you grow up, you don't know anything. Really, you don't know anything. You know, you just run with friends and have, you know, all my friends were Chinese. I mean, uh, looking back at it, there, were, there was a lot of learning opportunities for me. And, and I have some older pictures. My dad liked to take photography pictures. And I have some older pictures where I, I, I started noticing. I, I didn't really notice. My wife said to me first, she goes, why is that woman looking at you? She's looking at you. And I said, what do you mean? And I looked at it and I go, wow, because I was so different. And as a child, you know, it was difficult. When I was about seven, maybe, we had a beautiful dog called Lucky, a big German shepherd dog that would just love my grandfather. But I seemed to be the one to always play with him, but I never fed him. So that's probably the reason. <laughs> so uh, so uh, he was a big, beautiful dog. And, and I think all dogs are like that. And I'm playing with this little dog on the street. I think I'm playing with the dog and he snaps at me and bites me in the face. So I got to go and get rabies shots because they couldn't find a dog. So I went and got rabies shots and I'll never forget my father and my uncle, Uncle Andrew, were walking me to the hospital. And I'm a little kid, right? And we get to the hospital, I get my first injection in the stomach. And at that time, you're doing seven shots in the stomach every day. And uh, the second day I go back, and I know where we're going, and I'm begging my dad to take me. And I said, the only time in my whole life I ever saw my dad cry. You know, he had tears coming out of his eyes because he knew how much pain I was going through and how much pain he was going through. So, you know, that was, that was the difficult part of being there was just, you just, I mean, I would take the bus to school because I went to a Portuguese school. So I was not right there in the neighborhood. I would take a bus to school and... And I had a bus pass for a month and I'd always lose it, whether somebody took it or whether I'd left it somewhere like a kid would do. And I remember my dad, you know, taking the bus ticket and putting it around my neck and say, never take this off oh, for a month. I use a bus ticket to get there, but it seemed to have worked. So things, things were difficult there. I was fortunate. I had an uncle that was running a martial arts studio, uh, Kung Fu school. And uh, so I learned things as a young kid that really didn't, didn't really make me a better martial artist. It just gave me more confidence. You know, we talk about all the learning things you can do as a coach and all the learning things you can give to a player, a big part of it is self-confidence, isn't it? So I, I learned that. And then we came to the United States, especially to Asia. The Catholic Church got and sold that ship. My grandmother was born and baptized in Macau. I was, my whole family were. Well, myself and my sister were born and baptized in Macau. So they got us on a ship, and it was a merchant ship. And uh, it was a difficult time uh, on that ship. You know, very difficult time. I, I'd rather not go into it. Uh, sure. But we, we get to the United States. And we almost didn't get in because um, uh, the sister had tuberc tuberculosis. So they, they said, you have to go back. And, you know, you know, here we are. And uh, thank God the person had a heart and just said, okay, let's get you through. And then, uh, then we were sent to Ohio and then that's, that's how the whole story starts. So it was, it was a, a difficult time. I don't think, I don't really think back on it too much. You know, it was, because it was difficult. You know, you want to stay away. You want to have good memories, but it was, it was hard. And I, I think it made me, uh, quite honestly, it made me a little bit more wiser in life. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would, I would think, and I appreciate you sharing that. I just think it, you know, it, 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 it def the, those things define us. And I think most people in our, in our, in our world now don't, we think we have difficulty, but we don't, we don't have difficulty, but I would, I would assume that, you know, the compassion that folks showed you and the things that people did for you, make you who you are, right. They make you compassionate for people. You understand people's stories better. You, know, you have compassion for things that maybe 
you don't understand because maybe people don't, didn't understand what you were going through, right? And I think that as a coach, there's so many different people that you come across as players and families that you kind of mm-hmm. have to really adapt who you are as a coach to, to some of your people. So I'm sure those experiences helped help that as well, I would think. And how, do you think that that, or how does that kind of develop kind of your, your why, like why you, why you do what you do, why you did what you did as a coach? What, how would you explain what your, what your why is as a, as a, as a coach and as just through your day, through your, through your life? You know, yeah, you know, I think you, Paul, you really hit on some good points. I have a real big place in my heart for people especially for people who are struggles, you know, yeah. and I've never sat down and say, why am I like this? Am I, am I a softy? Am I weak? You know, why, why are you, why is it? Because that's uh, what By the way, think, sorry to you? interrupt, but I've never, I've never heard that about you being a, a softy. So <laughs> we'll go ahead and eliminate that. I think you're good. <laughs> you're good. Uh, okay. Now there's two sides of it. Okay. <laughs> okay. 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 Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, I have a real compassion for people, especially when they, when they find difficulty. I, I know when I came to the States, I was, we were poor, 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 poor. And I remember running around with, with tennis shoes on it with holes in them. And somebody, you know, I went and spent the night at somebody's house and God, I, you know, what, you have a, you have a room all to yourself? Yeah, it's my bedroom. I said, yeah, I share it with five people, you know, and I go, and then by chance, he opened up this, his closet to put on his play shoes or run around shoes. And he's got like four pairs of shoes there. And I'm going, oh, four pairs of shoes. I, I couldn't believe how, how rich he was. So it had a big impact on me seeing those shoes like that. And today I probably have 35 pairs of shoes. <laughs> <Speaking> of, <laughs> <laughs> shoes that I can't even wear. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I think I really have a, a soft spot in my heart. It hurts me a lot. And when I can't play a kid, because you know, the objective is to win. But it, it hurts me. When I have to go tell a, a young man, you're not going to make this road trip, you know, or you're not going to start today. I've hardly to realize that my job is not to, for this one player. My job is for the team. And I think that's how I, I get through that. Teaching people in the martial arts, you know, I, I don't know how many people I've taught thousands. And sometimes the stories you hear from them, why they went into the martial arts. Because everybody who comes and studies with me spends about 45 wouldn't be personally, you know, to see if they've been fit into the, the, the class. And so many of them will tell me their stories. And you, you, once you hear this, I want to get emotion here. Once you hear their stories, you never forget, you know, because uh, it's so much to go into. And I think maybe because of my stories, I, I have a little bit more of an opening, you know, heart, for example, does that make sense? Yeah. Hundred percent makes sense. You know, the, our our story define kind of mm. kind of who we are and and how we in the lens through which we look to hear other stories, right? And the filter through yeah, our yeah. ears and to our mind and how we how we impact others. And and I, I said that earlier about not being a softie, but I do know that about you also that you do have a compassionate side to you. So I didn't mean to I didn't mean to, to no, I for anybody that. to think that the coach uh, was <laughs> was a meanie by any by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> no, I, but, well, I know that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> But to, to, to be, to be, you know, a coach with the success that you've had for so long over so many different things. And, and it, you can go back and listen to these podcasts, folks that listen, so many folks and Phil mentioned this earlier have said, you know, someone that influenced me was, was, was Shellas. He had such an impact on me as a, not just a player or a coach, but as a person. And I really value that. And I think we, we've, we've said a lot of this show too, like it really isn't about the X's and O's, you know, it really is about those people and how you influence them and how you impact them. And I know you've done that. Uh, through your career, that's just uh, it, it, it's it's awesome, yeah. and I love uh, it's such a great influence on all of us uh, as we as we look to and the, the younger coaches too of making sure we're impacting these young people in a way that they can then go on and impact the world as well. So I appreciate you uh, sharing all that. Yeah, of course. So one of the things you have mentioned a few times is your passion for martial arts. And you're a 10th degree black belt. And may, maybe that's like 11th or 12th or 13th now. I don't know. Maybe that's maybe an old, <laughs> an old thing there. Who knows? I didn't know it went that high, but that's pretty amazing. And it's, uh, was it, was it Aiki Juju Jutsu? Jutsu? Is that yeah. how I say that? I, I, I yeah. totally hacked that, but that's probably not how you say it, but um, something like that. And then there's, there's a video flying around the internet that has some uh, uncom- very uncomfortable kicks to certain parts of the body that, that uh, is pretty uh, like crazy. 
um, for me to watch. But there's there's got to be a story behind that that people can go. We'll have a link to that in the show notes. But one of the things I want to talk with you about, too, is what are some of the things you've taken from martial arts? You know, I'd love to hear about that backstory, too, of just, you know, you, you say yeah. how you got into it. But some of the things you've taken from martial arts and used in your soccer coaching, like how, you know, we always love to talk about cross-discipline learning. No doubt that you've taken those lessons and use them in your coaching. And, and so I'd just love to kind of just talk about that with you. Yeah, I'm happy to, happy to. Like I said, in Macau, I, I studied a little bit, but I was very, very young. It wasn't going to be mm -hmm. a passion for me. My uncle, you know, still, well, now, now my cousin is still there teaching his arts. Mm -hmm. When I came to the States, good or bad, my mother married us. When my, my father died, my mother married and it really wasn't the best thing in our lives. Okay. He wasn't the best person for, for us as children, my sister and I as young adults. Um, so she had a, she had a very difficult time, hard life with him and, um, more, more to drinking and, and stuff like that. And, um, uh, so I chose to continue to start the martial arts to protect my family. Because when he was drinking, he was a, a real bad person and uh, was very mean to, to us. And uh, so I wanted to protect the family. I studied the arts. And you know, you're probably the first, first group of people I'm ever saying this to. But I had to defend my family. And so there were a lot of fighting. And, um, and I had to get better. And so it got to the point where he realized he wasn't going to win. So, um, and that just kept me in the martial arts for, from, from then on. And that was, uh, when I was about 16 and then, um, uh, and that kept me in the arts till just probably just before I went into, well, when I went into FC Dallas coaching, Clark Clint asked me not to do the martial arts, but just focus my whole time and, uh, in the coaching probably because he didn't want me so accessible to to people, you know, coming in the dojo, knowing who I am. So I, I, I decided to do that. And, um, but yeah, so I got promoted to a 10th degree black belt, which is really the highest you could go. I did some studies overseas. I had a test overseas. I did a lot of things that, that was, I thought was one crazy or impossible to do, <laughs> but it, you know, you talk about the carryover, the carryover when you're a soccer player. Oh, any, any of that, you could be a musician, you know, whatever it is, you have to have that passion, don't you? And you have to, because training in a dojo five nights a week for 35 years, I mean, it was my life. The, the hard part was separating soccer and, and martial arts because I'm, I'm living two lives. And I think sometimes my hardness in the martial arts became my hardness on the soccer field, you know, if that makes any sense at all. Yeah. Uh, but some, some of the carryover, of course, is, is just a self-discipline. So as a martial artist, you have to be self-disciplined because you're learning techniques to get really hurt people. And you have to control your, control your anger, your, your, your attitude, your, you know, your, your ability to understand that you're, you don't need to prove yourself. So self-confidence, don't we have that in our daily life and everything we do? So. How about commitment? You know, you have to be committed. If I'm going to be teaching you, I want you in my class. If you're not coming to my class, you're not committed. I'm not going to teach you. And uh, so I've, I've failed a lot of black belts because I never felt like they had the right attitude or right commitment. Technically, they were good, but inside they weren't. You have to have disciplines. You need that in every day of life. Whether you're an athlete or whether you are trying to be a doctor, medical doctor, you need to have discipline. And I think the areas that are a little bit different is, is always a learning process in the martial arts. You go from white belt to yellow belt to, to orange belt to purple belt to brown belt to black belt to different degrees of black belt. There's a learning process. You know exactly what you have to do to pass the next test. So you study for those things. and. And I think the learning process in soccer is we learn by doing. You know, we learn because the coach says, hey, this is the, 
Uh, this is how you're going to overlap. And if you're going to overlap, you can't overlap if there's no room for you to overlap. Wait for your wait for that player to come inside so that gives you space to go outside. So that's a learning process that someone is teaching you, but the learning process is just doing it over and over and over again. So do it and you learn. And then I think goal setting is much easier in the martial arts because you can say in three years, if I work out hard, I will probably be testing for my black belt. But in soccer, you can't say, well, three years, I'm going to get drafted into the pros, right? Because you're counting on someone else where in the martial arts, you want to count on yourself. So I think there's a lot of similarities with, with those two areas. I enjoy the coaching part of my soccer as much as I enjoy the playing part. And I think uh, my most difficult time today is not coaching. Now you say, well, what about coaching are you missing? I don't know if I'm missing coaching as much as I'm missing the interaction with the players and learning their life stories and helping them reach their goals. I, I, I mentor a lot of my ex-players that will call me that are playing pro coaches is going on. What do you think I should do? I think you need to just, you know, take a breath and call me back in a couple of hours. But right now you're too wound up. You know, or whatever, because that their emotions are taking, taking their, that making their decisions. So I think I've affected a lot of people, as you, as you mentioned, being around so many years. I get a lot of calls. A great satisfaction for me is when players I haven't seen for 15, 20 years, right now I'm back in Dallas and they're like, coach, I understand you're back. Can we have lunch? You know, they still care. And you know what the most common thing they say to me? Coach, I didn't appreciate you. So I had my own kids. <laughs> and I'm trying to help them think of various. <laughs> yeah. That's you know, I've, told, I've told that story before too, coach, with like, and I played for Coach Paulson at Presbyterian. And when I first started coaching, I, I called him not long after I started coaching. He said, Coach, I think I owe you an apology for a number of things, <laughs> coach. You know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. I was, I was just going to say, coaches out there, uh, really, if you didn't hear that really well, like go back and listen to that again. What really matters are those relationships. Yeah. At the end of the day, that's what lasts wins, losses, championships. Yeah, those are, those are all great in the moment. But over time, what are you, what are you going to look back on and, and miss, first of all? But what are you going to look back on and really value? What's going to really be part of that legacy? Are those lives that you impacted, those lives that you led? and that are now hopefully able to lead because of some of the touch points you had in their lives. So I so much appreciate that, that, you know, thank yeah. you. Just thank you. Yeah. Coach, I want to dive a little bit as we're talking about coaching and impacting and, you know, you've had, you've had such an amazing experience. I mean, starting out in, you know, in Brazil, you know, with that experience and then taking that into, you know, college coaching, it, it take us through a little bit, some of the differences you saw if, 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 and I don't know if, if you can compare or not, because the beginning of your career was the UK, you played college soccer, but then you went to Brazil or no, you, you coached in Brazil first and played, or did you, That's right, what was I that? coached in Brazil first. Uh -huh. Yeah. You coached in Brazil first. What was the coaching? Like, what did you take exactly from coaching in Brazil into the U S game? And then take us through a little bit of some of the differences that you've seen the, the game as it, as it developed, so to speak, right? Like, you know. When you came, when you came to Eastern Illinois, it was like, man, okay, I'm not coaching professionals. I'm, I'm now with high school seniors. And then as you stayed in college coaching, how did you see the game develop um, yeah. from, a, from a coach's mind, from your experience, having been in Brazil? Yeah. When, when I was in Brazil, I was coaching a high school team. Okay. So these are Brazilian boys who are going to an American Brazilian school and uh, getting their education so they can coach, hopefully to college in the United States. So I was dealing with a pretty, pretty intelligent group. Uh, the other part was I was I was a student of the game. I was doing an estagio, so I was studying. Yeah. When I came to the States, it was uh, being back in my old mother, which I told you many times that I loved being back there. I felt like this was, was God taking, you know, smiling on me. And I, I enjoyed that. But I was coaching players in college that were pretty similar to my own age. There was no age regulation back in those, in those days, you know, when you're talking 74, 75, 76. You know, so players can be as old as you are, 
was coaching players that were on the Ghana national team. You know, I mean, they were very good players. And I had the wisdom not to try to change them, but try to help them get better at what they did. And, and I enjoyed their companies. I mean, my office was open. Players would always come in. And where we kind of drew the line was when it came down to them personally. You know, I didn't want to ever want to talk about them. I wanted to talk about the team because I didn't want it to be favoritism mode. I mean, they're trying to get a starting spot from coach. And that, so I was very aware of those conversations. But, you know, I'm going off, the, off your question here a little bit. I think it's important. As I became an older coach, as, as was mentioned, the relationships with the players were the biggest things. Okay, the trust the players. Traders trust me. I trust the players. And what, what ended up happening was, I wanted, as, as time has changed, we all see this, players are taking more control of their teams than they have when I was a young coach. And the young coach, it was my team. As we moved on, it was our team. So the rules and regulations that I had, many of us had as coaches, I took away those words, rules and regulations. I went to the words of qualifications. Qualification for being a member of the team. And the reason being, they're almost like rules, but I call them a different thing, right? So qualifications, let's, let's give an example. Comes to training on time. Well, you broke a rule. I'm going to have to punish you. Not coming to training on time. You did not meet the qualifications of the team. You did it to yourself. Yeah. You see, so no longer am I uh, punishing you, but you broke the qualifications. So now you're punishing yourself. And it's interesting how those simple words like that change attitudes. So. How can I get the team more involved in, in the destiny, their own trips, their own destiny? I started a leadership council. Okay, the leadership council made up of five people. And it was a freshman player, sophomore player, a junior player, a senior player, and then another player of my choice. And, and I interviewed each person, probably went about 45 minutes about the role that they would be in. And I always remember one of the questions I asked them, do you think you could be a good leader on this leadership council if you were not a starter? Now, once they say, yes, I can, then I'm holding them to that, right? right. So when, right. When, they, when they don't agree with something, I'm holding it. Why? Is it because you're not starting? <laughs> you know. But, <laughs> uh, and I wanted somebody from each class because they, they have their own little click. You know, when they come in as freshmen, that's their little click. They get to know others. And then we sat down and I had them so involved that we met once a week, whether we did it to or not, discuss things. And they would bring you issues and problems. And the team realized that they were leaders in many ways. They were better leaders on the team than my captains. The captain's responsibility was on the field. And the leadership council responsibility was to make sure the culture of the team was what we all wanted to be. So, you know, I think those are some of the things as a younger coach you can really think of is it is, it is easy for me to say to, to you, I work out every day. What do you do? I run three miles every day. Okay. But if you and I did it together, I'd make sure I'm committed to it because I don't want to let you down. But if I'm doing it by myself, I, mean, I don't feel like doing it today. It's kind of cold out there. It's, you know, it's wet out there. But isn't it amazing when you, when you do things together, you not only will continue to do it, but you will almost feel obligated to it because you don't want to let your friend down or your teammate down. So that was one of the areas I, I think really helped in my growth as a coach was uh, it's harder to walk away from something when you've committed it to your teammates. And then just to walk away from something when you do on your own. Why do you see so many people go to a gym after New Year's? Get my body in shape, right? And a month later, they're done. <laughs> so, yeah. But 
Yeah, that, that accountability is, is, is crucial, you know, especially in the, in the college game, you know, if they've got accountability to themselves, especially in that period where as coaches, you don't, you don't have access to them, so to speak, right. During the summer months yeah. where you really aren't allowed to know what they're doing. If they don't have that accountability going into those summer months, you're right. If they're held to their, uh, to their own, they're probably not going to be as successful in their return as they would if they've been accountable to their, to their teammates. And I think as coaches too, I think mean, one thing you brought there with that leadership council is you've kind of created an area there where now you're even more accountable to your team, right? Cause you have to face them once a week. You can't hide in, in your office or behind your desk. No. You've created an accountability system even for yourself as a coach, which I think I don't want that to be missed on our coaches. Hey, well, you're in charge, but the reality is, you know, if you want the buy-in, that account that your players need to see your accountability as well. Is that, did you see that as kind of a, a response, a positive response to your team as well? Cause they saw your buy-in to everything. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I was, and I think it takes time to get, get to this point. I was so confident in myself that I would open up and accept new ideas. I give you a quick story. I mean, First year, first year at Grand Canyon University, I get a phone call out of the blue. And the guy goes, Good, Coach Hyman, welcome to Grand Canyon University. I just want you to know I'm an Uber driver. I drive Uber car. Okay, well, great. I picked up two of your players Saturday night that were drinking hard. Max, that one was thrown up in my car. I said, Right. And of course, these are things you want to know, right? So I said, Can you tell me? Well, he said, I come out to the games and, and I go to these guys and I go, well, tell me who they are. Oh, I can't do that, coach. I can't tell you who they are. Accountability, right? How many times do we get that from players? Coach, we got some guys on the team that are partying too much. Well, who are they? Well, I can't tell you that, coach. I'm part of the team. Well, this guy didn't want to get him in trouble. And I get that. But why the hell call me? You know? So so I said, okay, I'll tell you what I want you to do. Call me back in 10 minutes. Let me think that's true. So he calls me back in 10 minutes. And I said, listen, I don't know you. I don't, you know, your name's Pete, you know, and, and now, but you're telling me something is really, really important for me. I'm the first year coach here. And I'm trying to set a coach here up. And this is important. So would you reconsider? Tell me who they are. Coach, I can't do that. I can't do that. I said, okay, how about this? How about if I give you the initials of who I think it could be? Because we know our players, don't we? Right, yeah. So I gave him the initials, and he said, bingo. Said, Thank you. So I brought the players in. One said to me, yes, coach, you know, uh, I was with, the, uh, with, with my teammate, and uh, we were drinking pretty hard. Okay. The other one denied it all. Who do you think I let go? One in denial. Yeah, because all I'm seeing is the tip of the iceberg. You know, we've all been there. If if my mom says to me, you know, I go clean your shoes, and I and I don't clean them once, probably I'm not going to clean them the next time either. So um, I had to let that young man go. But the other kid, two years down the road, was my captain. So what a great effect I had on his life. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I, I love that coach. Cause we, you know, we would always have the rule that, that you're, you're going to make, not, not the rule, but we'd say, Hey, you're going to make mistakes. We're, we're all humans. We're going to make mistakes, but lying on top of it is, is the yeah. worst thing you could ever do to any of us you know, by not telling the truth. You know, one thing I want to dive into, and this, I mean, I think this is one of those, this could be a series of interviews, coach. You got so much knowledge and experience. I love it. How, how did, you know, the things that you just talked about, how did that transition Differently or similarly, when you went over to the pro game? Ooh. The pro game in many ways was one of the best things I've ever done. In other ways, one of the worst things I've ever done. <laughs> and because it was a whole new process. It was a whole new learning process. You mentioned it earlier. It's not about the X and O's. We all know X and O's. It's about managing people. And if you lose the locker room, you lose it. You lose the team. I had an advantage, but I also had a disadvantage. Because when I took over the team, 
I was a very successful college coach. I think we all can, can say I was successful. But I never coached a pro team. And these players are different. Their expectations. They thought Jose Marino should have been hired, not Joe Hyman. You know, their expectations. We're pros. We need a pro coach. We don't need a college coach. So I had to prove myself to them. And it was not easy because I had naysayers in the locker room before my first day. I had people that didn't want me there. They wanted a pro coach. You know, uh, I'm an Argentine player. I want somebody from Buenos Aires, from, you know, one of the best teams, you know, uh, River Plate. And that's where I grew up. And that's where I should be coached. And, and so they made life really difficult for me. Couldn't trust them. So I tried to do a leadership council with them. It completely failed because the cultures were different. When I think back to it, the end goal was not the same. The end goal for, for some of the players, especially the American boys, was to find success. I think the end goal for some of them was get the coach back. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that, that you live with. No one probably worked any harder than me. I was in the office nine in the morning. I had people six or seven every night, you know, and, and my, it was funny. My assistant coaches would never leave before the head coach left. You go, that's, that's tradition, right? You don't leave, you know, yeah, when I'm playing golf coach, I'll see you tomorrow. You don't, that kind of stuff don't work. Okay. Day. So one day, uh, John Ellinger, who was my assistant said, you know, these guys ain't going to leave coach. So you leave. Like, what are you talking about? So he told me, I said, okay. So I got in the car. Guys, I got to leave early. It's 4 o'clock. No problem, coach. All right. See you. See you tomorrow, right? I get in my car and I drive around the building, get around the stadium, and wait for them. And true to the word, 10 minutes later, they're all jumping in the car. And I let them drive. And I, hey, I forgot something. You know, I'm going to go to the with you, coach. Get out of here. When you're done with your work, you're done with your work. But it was, it was hard. And I had a severe situation. An agent came to me and said, and, and I really liked his agent. He got me some really good players. And he says, Shellas, you don't have the locker rooms. I go, what do you mean I don't have the locker room? You know, I know, I know. But he goes, no, no, you don't have the locker room. There, there are a couple of guys in the locker room that are trying to get you fired every day. They're trying to manipulate more and more. Well, tell me who they are. I can't do that. Does that sound like the story from the yeah. guy, that, the, the Uber driver? This is where I learned this story. This is how I started this. I said, well, let me give you initials. And he gave me, I gave him the initials. He told me, yes, I never told you who they were. Okay, I only answer your initial question. And I was able to move them on, which made my life a lot easier. You know, it's, um, you, you cannot take a pail of water from the river and carry a full pail of water back to, to your house if you have holes in a, in a pail. No matter, no matter what you do, you have holes in the pill. You're going to lose, uh, lose the water. And I, and I see that like a team. You have to have them all together. And if you're losing some of them, it will affect the others. Pretty soon you got nothing. And I think a lot of the players look for strength. You know, somebody who's going to be consistent, strong. Uh, we turned the program around uh, uh, quickly. I think it was two years we were, we were finding ourselves at the playoffs. And we were happy with that. Came close to winning a championship. So I think it kind of proved to itself. But even at the professional level, you have to discipline players. You know, you don't want to, but you have to discipline. I mean, some, I won't say names, but you have to discipline some players. Some American players need to be put in their place. And uh, I had this player from, from France calls, calls me. I would coach him to be late at practice. Is he going to be late at practice? What's the matter? Uh, I got a flat tire on my truck. I said, really? So where, what road do you want? He told me. I said, okay, I'll be driving out there to, to help you get your, your tire on. Coach, no problem. The tow truck's here right now. He, 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 he wasn't like, uh, right. but, uh, yeah. but you know, you almost, they, you almost have to almost uh, use all your experiences just because they're pros doesn't mean that they're, they're mature. You know, they're, they're gifted. And what you need to do is give them some direction and some, some suggestions at times. Yeah, there, there's so much there. Like Paul said, we could we could dig deep. And I think what some of you said there is they're they're pros, but it doesn't mean they're mature. It doesn't mean they're adults. It doesn't mean I mean, and that's what we forget about a lot of these kids that as a manager, as a coach, 
your job is so much more than X's O's, even at the pro level. You and you see that more and more and more in this twenty four hour news cycle with like the Mason Greenwoods and the yeah. and the you know and or going to the other sports like the Josh Hamilton with baseball and you know these different people that have these lives. Then I just finished Dwight Gooden, you know uh, his story and reading. It's just tragic because these people don't have people in their lives who are keeping them accountable. Because they can kick a ball well, or they can throw yep. a ball well, or they can do something well, and they have this tremendous talent, we just assume, oh, they must have everything all together. And what we forget is their kids. What we forget is a lot of them come from backgrounds that didn't never had anybody keeping them accountable. To the contrary, they had people telling them how great they are, and they started believing it. And they they got to the point where they were thought they were above law, above authority, above accountability. And that's something that, as a coach, we have such a huge privilege. Yes and responsibility. And if we don't, we don't take that responsibility seriously. I think we will lose so much of what our job and what our, what our, what our privilege is, what we get to do in the lives of these people. And if we miss that, I think we miss so much. I mean, what are your, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, you're absolutely right. You know, I, I tell you a quick story. I go, I won't, I won't say the country because this people might know who I'm talking about. I go to South America and find a player coming, coming out of a favela, you know, poor, or a poor kid that at a young age, um, the club finds him and now he's staying at the club, sleeping at the club, you know, and, and all those type of things. But it's so many of those young players that are brought in to maybe one day bring me money to the club, you know, by selling them. And this young kid, as I looked into it, this young kid was left at the church. Yeah, the parents dropped him off, said, we can't raise this kid. Okay, so now he's poor. So he's in the club. I go down, see him play. Outstanding. Pure, pure athleticism. Quick as can be. And um, good player. And I talked to our, our ownership. To, Let's buy him. So we buy him, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back on the plane with him. I'm going to get him on the plane, and we're going to bring him back with me. I look over at him as he's sleeping and he's sucking his tongue. Okay. He's a 18 year old and he's sucking his tongue. And the first thing that went through my mind was, oh my God, I just, I just bought a kid, you know, as the days went on, this was in my mind, as the days went on, he was a kid that needed voting. No one ever gave him compassion. Nobody cheered what he was going through. But, uh, you know, hey, let's go out for lunch, coach. You know, I don't have any money. Don't worry. You're going to get a lot of money. I'll buy you lunch. When you make your money, you buy me lunch. And and make him feel important. Well, he turns out to be a great player in Italy and sold overseas. You know, so that's a good story. But you think about it. Can you imagine what was going through my mind? When I saw this this 18-year-old sucking his thumb sleeping, you know, and there were times in training I had to say, get your thumb out of your mouth. You know, I mean, he, he didn't realize that it wasn't acceptable, you know, in our culture. So, you know, we can have a great influence on people. And I think, I really think as coaches, I've had my son who was a good player, grandson who was a good player, my daughter was a good player. So I'm out there a lot to youth soccer. And I've always made a point of being uh, a, a parent, never a soccer expert. And people would come to me and say, what do you think's going on? Why would this happen? I said, I don't know. Well, you probably need to ask the coach. I don't know what they've been working on, you know, in training. And I think, I think what we need to do is kind of let our kids grow up a little bit, you know. But at the same time, they got a bad coach. And I'm not talking about bad coach in coaching technique or something. I want to, I want to play a defensive block. Okay. I don't need that as a coach. That's the coaching talent. I mean, a bad human being. I'm talking about somebody who's tearing you down instead of building you up. Somebody who's more concerned, and this is too often, more concerned about their wins than the players' wins, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I want a good record. I want, and, and it was hard sometimes because Sheila Simon shows up and there, it's not deep or like my wife was saying, you know, they're doing this because they're trying to impress you. And I go, how can they, how can they impress me? 
I'm going to bring a youth coach into my, my pro team. You know, I can't help it, <laughs> but you never know. But just last week, I got a call from, from a club coach. Do you have time to meet with me? I always have time to meet with people because he coached my daughter, you know, 12 years ago. So, and he's looking at, Hey, I'm taking over this club. Any, any ideas? I don't know. Not. And, and we'll sit there and talk. He had the ideas before we sat and talked. He just wanted confirmation. So, um, but, but. I think these are the big things in life. And there's so much that we as coaches must do that we don't hold high on our list of things to do. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And I think you said so many things in there. And one of the things people really hear that when he said, I always have time for people. Now, obviously there are times where you're with your wife and with your kids. Playing yeah. pickleball, for instance. You know, yeah, you, 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 but you <laughs> even saying that, like you made time for a few minutes. You grabbed a few when I was talking to you there and then made time for this interview. But ask the question, people seek out advice from people, seek out the mentorship people. That, that's something we haven't, you know, we could talk for hours about and just how that side of things with you. But but ask ask the people for advice and listen, even if it is just confirming, um, because that's so important for us to know. And there are wise people who have gone ahead of us who can speak to us. And I know that's your story as well. And to that point, you've coached with uh, a lot of great people. You've played for great people. You, you've been part of this game, played and coached this game for the past six decades, which is crazy to think about. But in all that time, who would you say is, is maybe you can't say one, but one of the, if not the best coach or a couple coaches you played for or coached with and what set that uh, person apart from the rest? Yeah, good question. But, you know, I, I have been fortunate to be around some good people. And uh, the first thing that goes through your mind is the people that are successful. Mm -hmm. You know, a Ziggy Smith, successful. Good friend of mine. But when you go deeper into the history, Ziggy Smith coached UCLA, Shallow Time, and coached SFU. We played against each other, usually in NCAA, because NCAA in their wisdom always had a a strong SMU team play a West team because of travel, right? So UCLA was always a pretty strong team. So we always play against each other. And I remember one, one day uh, we were in Vegas and we were together in a tournament. And Ziggy says, Come, hey, we're in Vegas. Let's go out tonight and uh, we'll get a dinner and just have some fun, okay? And I said, okay, as we're walking out, one, one of his players, I won't say who it was, one of his players came in with a 12-pack of beer. And he looked at him. And Ziggy looked at me, says, you know, I got to go deal with this. I said, absolutely. I'll wait for him. So he went up and deal with it. We never had another conversation on it, but the responsibility didn't stop when practice was over. The responsibility was to carry on throughout the whole player's career in college. So I think Ziggy was one. Bruce, another very, very successful coach, but Bruce has a little bit of... Uh, standoffish. He doesn't share all his knowledge. I mean, Bruce was treating me pretty, very well. I don't know if he treated everybody very well, but he treated me very well. A, uh, a person we lost, lost uh, uh, Mooch Meyernick. You know, what a great guy. When I was doing coaching education, Mooch was my first roommate, and we spent a lot of time together and talked a lot about soccer. This is when he was an assistant at Hartman. And then you, uh, another roommate that I had in coaching education was Ansel Dorch, you know, who you're talking about a legend and, and a wonderful human being, you know, you, we can have legends here, tyrants, uh, a wonderful human being, Mike Berticelli, you know, who brought me into coaching education. And I have to tell you guys, I learned so much about myself. And I learned so much about the game, being around so many good coaches, watching them do their training sessions and coaching education. You know, I, I mean, it was, it was truly amazing. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I was, I've been blessed in that manner. So I, I think the person I talk to probably the most today is uh, Barry Gorman, who is a colleague and a good friend, you know, coach at Penn State through coaching education. We go to World Cups together. We go, we're getting ready to go this summer to the Euros. We spend a lot of time sharing ideas and soccer thoughts. But the person that probably affected me the most, and I saved him for less, the person that probably affected me the most 
was a sports psychologist named Bill Bezik. Bill Bezik comes out of England. I met him 22 years ago in a coaching course. We became close. I asked him for help. He gave me help. I used to bring him in for my clinics. I brought him into FC Dallas for 10 days. And where he worked with me, he worked with Alex Ferguson at Man U, worked with Steve McLaren, who he mentored. And he still picks up a phone when I call him. And uh, when I was having issues, he helped me. Remember, remember the story I was telling you about the problems I had with the players when I went to FC Dallas? No. I called Bill Benzik. Bill, can I get you to come over? Sure. What's the problem? I got, some, I got, I got locker room problem. He came out and watched my first training session. Not the first one I've ever done, but his first training session where he watched me. And then I took him and my two assistant coaches, well, three assistant coaches, and we all went out for dinner. And I sat there and I said, Bill, you've only seen one training session. What do you think? I, I swear to God, my witness, you said you got two players hmm. that you didn't get rid of in one training session. Because he wasn't watching the training session. He was watching the players. And I said, well, what do I do now? And he goes, well, put them on a shelf. And you can't get rid of them now because they're under contract. But just know, put them on a shelf and know they will not be with you next year. And that was, that was great advice. Yeah, oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, Coach, there's so much wisdom in, in just when you speak. Uh, I so appreciate um, everything. But we've got two two final questions that we ask all yep. of our guests. So we've got to, unfortunately, wrap wrap things up here. So for, first question for you, Coach. How have the lessons you've learned directly from the game of soccer impacted marriage and parenting? Well, the game of soccer, marriage and parenting. Well, the, the thing that, that I go back to is, I really believe this. The game of soccer might not have affected completely my commitment in life. Okay, I think my commitment in life is uh, through my experiences. But something I hold very valuable is being a good Christian. I think if I'm a good Christian, and I care for, for people, whether they're soccer players or whether they're my children or my wife, you know, I will treat them well. The thing I want to do is spend more time with my family. I want to spend more time with my family and my friends. And I think what you find is some of my best friends in life today are the guys I play college soccer with. And I'm sure you could say that same, you know. Because you go through something in life together and you stay in contact. I have a thread with all my teammates on it that, that's still with us. And we talk about stories. Um, I think it's because I, I love the game so much. I want to share my knowledge with my family members. I want them to be a part of my trips. I, we went to the Urals. My wife and daughter came with me. I took my son to Brazil when I was in Brazil. He, doing some more coaching education and put him with a club team. So I think I, I have the ability to connect and I want to share that with my, my family. Uh, and just teaching courses and coaching education is a huge thing for me. Teaching people how to, how to get better. And I think uh, where I am is, is the, the bottom thing is I just, I just want to enjoy life with my family. Do you, do you know how much time I've taken away from my family through my love for soccer? You know, and, uh, it, you know, you're coaching for so many years. There's times you, I can't go. Uh, I know you went on much time, so I just tell a quick story. My daughter comes to me. I said, Dale, will you make me a promise? Yes, sweetheart. Well, what is it? Of course, I love you. She's like 17. Will you promise me that you'll come to my high school graduation? Yeah. What daughter asks yeah. you that in your life? What child would ever ask you if you're going to come to their high school graduation? 
I said, of course I'll beat your high school graduates up. Your dad, what do you think? Yeah, I love you. Well, 20 minutes later, I realized that the lean had yet to publish our, our schedule. <laughs> I could be having a game someplace on her day of her graduation. So I went back to her and said to her, honey, you know, uh, I don't know if I'll, but 100%, I'm going to be there. But if I got to be in New York playing the game, it's going to be hard for me to be in both places. Her comment was, that's okay, dad. I don't want you ever to worry about it. Because you haven't been to one of my high school events yet. So think about that statement. And you know, as coaches out there listening, we put ourselves in that position. Because the players that I've taught in soccer, who are very important to me, the people I've taught in the martial arts are very important to me. But they're only in a part of my life. My family, I will be forever. So maybe figuring that one out. <laughs> uh, thanks for sharing that, Coach. That's awesome. Totally agree with you on those. Yeah, yeah. And uh, there's so much in this episode that uh, really, really think about. And now it's no wonder that you, and I'm very grateful that you are a mentor to so many coaches who are hearing this from, you know, cause it's, it, it's a different game now and it's, there's different expectations and different demands on coaches and, um, they often are incompatible with the, the being the parent and the, and the, the husband or wife that, that yeah. you know, really need to be and are called to be. So very grateful for that, uh, that, that last answer and that last, uh, exhortation. So thank you. The last question we have is what have you watched, read, or listened to that has most impacted your thinking on how soccer explains life and leadership? Yeah, I read, I read of all, all of Bill Benzik's books, sports psychology. His most recent one is change your story. You don't like the way things are going. Change your story. You're the only one that can change it. Player to play for me, Justin. Uh, and I tell this story quite a bit when I'm doing speaking engagements. Came to three of my camps, wasn't quite good enough to make the team, but he wanted to come to Grand Canyon University. And I said to Justin, I said, Justin, I don't, you won't make the team. I need you to go somewhere else. Well, you know, we discussed things. And then finally I said, okay, I'll bring you in. You will only have preseason. If you don't make it preseason, you gotta, you gotta accept the fact that you're not gonna be with us. Justin comes in shape, as good a shape as you can imagine. And perform well. We had an injury, couldn't be in the left back position. He's a number 10. He's a striker, you know, a withdrawn striker. He's a number 10. And I put him back there. If you want to make the team, you're going to play there. Okay. Played 28 minutes of his whole freshman year. South Korea, he played a little bit more, but he was on the leadership council because he's a wonderful kid. Junior year, he starts. Then he scored the team. <laughs> Senior year, he becomes all American. Gets drafted in the first round by Portland Timbers. It wasn't that I was wrong about him, his, his ability. What I was wrong about him was his character, his determination, and his personality. He ate it up. He ate every information I gave him. And he set no limits on himself. And so the book from Bill Belzig really got me going. Change your story. And Justin did that. Other people I read too, I read, uh, there's a great book out there, Living on the Volcano or Sitting on the Volcano, about the managers that they get let go and how difficult their lives are when they're over in England coaching the, in the leagues. And they have to perform. At the end of the day, they have to perform. Why I would read that book for young coaches is those are professionals, coaches that are making close to a million dollars. You're a club coach. And just make it ends meet. Don't put your whole reputation on the coach in a club team. Develop the kids. Develop relationships. And then I watch a heck of a lot of soccer on TV. Doesn't matter who. Man, you was playing Copenhagen today at 2 o'clock. I'll watch it. Okay, so I know uh, how important it is for me. I know the modern trends in the game. And I, I think those things are important. I do. I do summer camps that are free. I get to take kids. I go back to my community. I do free camps. When I say free, I don't get paid. But I donate it to my high school because they took care of me when I was young. Yeah, you know, um, 
I I am with you. I watch a lot of soccer. Bringing up the Man U Copenhagen game, though, as a United supporter, that kind of brings a you know a little dagger there, um, reminder of the Champions League um, not so greatness this year. So, but yeah. other than that, you know, um, very grateful for everything that you said today. Um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, in in all seriousness, thank you so much. Thank you yes. so much for uh, being on the show. Being, but more than that, thank you so much for being who you are and who you've been. And I'm excited to hear about how God works in and through you through retirement with your with your family and what yeah. you'll continue, no doubt, continue to give to the game and to the coaches in the game and to the people playing the game. Uh, for the no doubt, as long as you're with us, you will be doing that. So thank you so much. It's my pleasure, and I appreciate Paul making it this time on, on the call. And, uh, uh, I'm always well, available for any follow up or sharing ideas. Please don't don't hesitate. I think we we all love the game enough to to make it better. Thank you so much. Well, folks, thank you. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I know Paul and I did. Thank you for being a part of this podcast. Thank you for being a part of what we do. And um, I pray that uh, you take all that you're, you're learning from this show and you use it. You, you truly use it. Engage it like we talk about. If you want to learn more about Warrior Way that Paul talked about at the beginning of the show, we got that in the show notes. If you want to learn more about coaching the bigger game or or disc training or anything that uh, that we're doing through Providence, uh, you can check that out in the show notes as well. But as always, we hope that you're taking what you're learning and you're using it to be a better coach, a better parent, a better spouse, a better player, a better leader, better in all that you do. And continually remind yourself that soccer does explain life and leadership. Thanks a lot. Have a great couple of weeks.